hyperbolic geometry. Shortest way to sort of describe it is by saying that it's the geometry that would be detected by a creature living entirely on a tree. If you have say something like a tree branching out and you want to go from one branch to another by moving entirely along the tree. So you, you come down from one branch till you hit the meeting point with the next branch and then you go up along it. So you look at the union of these two branches along with the stem that looks like a Y. And what's interesting about this triangle formed out of two branches of a Y is that all three sides meet at the meeting point. That's certainly not true of triangles that we see in Euclidean space. The other part of the story is that uh, this hyperbolic geometry, if you look at a tree, you'll start seeing that the branches become smaller and smaller as we travel towards the tip. Finally, you reach the leaves. And even inside the leaves, there are sort of replicas of these uh, branches. And uh, this, the reason why things become smaller is that you can't fit a large amount of this hyperbolic structure inside this flat Euclidean three space in which we live. And uh, so it starts making the sizes smaller and smaller to fit in this large hyperbolic geometry structure inside a flat three-dimensional Euclidean space. And so you have the surface of the tree, which is very, very uh, crinkled, so to speak. And uh, that crinkled shape has a formal name in mathematics. It's called a fractal. So the surface structure, the, the two-dimensional surface of the tree has this fractal structure. And it's an inevitable end product of having a three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry of a tree underlying it. So this dichotomy between three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry and a fractal geometry on the two-dimensional fractal geometry on the boundary is really a kind of naive analog of uh, what I have focused a substantial part of my mathematical career on. And there was a conjecture of Thurston, the person who founded the area in the 70s, um, which says that in a certain very precise sense, the two-dimensional geometry of the fractal and the three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry capture the exact same amount of information. And one component of that program was uh, what I had proved. There is this uh, tendency to feel that, okay, these axioms seem to have suddenly come from air. And I think uh, what happened was Euclid asked himself the same question whether the fifth postulate really follows from the remaining four axioms. And it turned out that you can do geometry very consistently, assuming the first four axioms, but violating the parallel postulate. Okay? And that gave rise to a hyperbolic geometry, and then a very general class of geometries called Riemannian geometry later on. So, if students sort of start asking themselves questions about challenging as axioms, I mean, when we read it in school, we were told an axiom is a self-evident truth. It's not, okay? That's, that's just some legacy of uh, a very dictatorial kind of education system, yeah? It's not. So if uh, students would like to inquire into what's given to them, and uh, try to find out new formal abstract structures, then hyperbolic geometry really gives it to you. Ask the question why rather than okay, yes. Why are we taking this for granted? Okay? And that question, if it's serious, it's not just some silly nihilism, but uh, trying to find out underlying structure, then very often it gives rise to deeper mathematics. So I think uh, the toughest challenge that many of us face is in grad school. Before proving our first theorem, one never knows whether one will be able to get one's first result or not. But one just has to keep at it and then somehow something happens. And <laughs> I mean, anybody who does research has actually this experience. And you're sort of accustomed to remaining stuck, knowing that at some point of time, you'll get some insight. Yeah. 
it's 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 the, i mean you you have seen many things before uh, you sort of get on with proving something but this instinct that there is this kind of a structure underlying is what we call insight or intuition that's probably i would say the most uh, powerful thing in the doing of mathematics without that uh, i don't think a person can be a practicing mathematician really it's not a formal reasoning process the formal reasoning sort of comes afterwards the intuition is sort of tells you okay this is the direction i ought to look in most indispensable otherwise a computer would be doing mathematics it does not first of all oh boy i got lucky <laughs> and uh, then i think the afterthought was it's it's pretty humbling i mean in the sense that okay so i really ought to get on with it and actually do some maths to deserve this <laughs> i think the relevance of prizes for um, practitioners is that uh, i mean it's like sort of okay you're doing something right go ahead continue doing it but it's yeah it should not be a motivation it should certainly not be a motivation and because then one is going to feel frustrated if one does not win awards i mean that's then i think the purpose of doing maths is defeated